Well, hello to everyone and welcome to Grace. My name is Maddie. And I'm Logan. And it is so good to see you this weekend here at our online campus. We're here coming to you from our Lakewood Ranch campus, but no matter where you're joining us from right now, we are here to help you connect with Jesus and to help you find God's direction for your life. That's right. So just hang tight because in just a moment, you're invited to sing along with our Grace worship team as they lead us in powerful worship, interact with others on the chat who are also watching live during service, and then lean in as we hear from our amazing lead pastor, Dr. Chip Bennett. Now, before all that, I wanna give you a quick reminder that here at our church, you can be more than just a spectator. Even while you're tuning into our online campus, you actually can participate in today's service in a bunch of different ways. And one of the easiest ways is just to share this online experience. See, it may not really seem like that big of a deal, but the more shares and more people we get to subscribe to our church and our services, the more impact we get to have in our community and also around the world. Yeah, and even more than that, we are living in a day and age where people are searching for answers and significance in their lives. And by sharing today's service, how cool is it that you could be a part of someone's spiritual journey? That's awesome. Yeah, so please take a second or two to hit the share button, copy the link, and then share it anywhere, in an email, a text message, so Social media. On top of a rooftop, yelling or in skywriting, wherever you want to share it. Yeah, you know what? Don't do that. But seriously, you can share it wherever. You never really know whose life you might change forever just by sending them a link. All right, now service is about to get started. So let's get excited as we get ready to go into worship and then hear from Pastor Chip. And as you're preparing your heart, remember what it says in Romans 5, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrated his love for me and for you by laying his life down and raising again. And now all of our sin is dead and gone because of that. Isn't that amazing? That is so amazing. Guys, God's love for us is so incredible. And you know, with that, we just want to focus on that truth this weekend as we lift up the name of Jesus. But as always, from all of us here at our church, thank you for being here and welcome to Grace. Shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone I won't be shackled to the way I was So I'm gonna live like my chains are gone
continue to sing in worship today. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. And lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made way to let mercy come in. Cause when death was arrested and my life began, and ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. And my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. That's when death was arrested and my life began. See your grace, oh, your grace, so free. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Cause my shame is ransomed, faithfully bore. Cancel my debt, call me his friend. Oh, when death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over. displayed on a criminal's cross and darkness rejoices as though heaven had lost but then Jesus rose with our freedom in hands that's when death was arrested in my Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. It's your Yes, we're free, free. 
Thanks for worshiping with us, Grace Fam. And before we continue into worship, we are here once again to welcome anyone who may have just jumped onto our service online. We are so grateful to have you here at our online campus. And as an extra special shout out, we want to especially take this moment right now to welcome anyone who is joining us as a new guest. At almost every one of our services, both in person and virtually, there's typically someone who is joining us for the first or second time. Or maybe you're tuning in, but you haven't quite made Grace your home church yet. Well, if that's you, we want to acknowledge all of our new guests and let you know how much it means to us that you're here with us today. We encourage all of you to drop in on the chat and say hey, or just let us know where you're streaming from. But more importantly, we also would love to connect with you personally as well. And to help us do that, you can either visit our website at gracesarasota.com and click the About tab. Or you can use your phone to text new guest SRQ with no spaces to the number 97000. Doing either of those things will allow you to fill out our digital connect card, which is a quick and simple way for us to just get to know you so that we can connect with you, we can pray for you, and we'll even send you a free gift as well. Free gifts are awesome. Who doesn't love a free gift? Love that. So guys, listen, please check those things out. But the most important thing that we all want you to know is that we are so glad you're here with us this weekend. So welcome. Now, as a special treat, we have a Grace Snapshot video that our creative team has put together for you. Check it out. Suncoast Blood Center uh, just celebrated our 72nd anniversary. And our mission, we feel privileged to bring people together, those that donate and those that receive the blood products. And not only collection, but in transfusing the blood and getting distributing the blood to 15 of our local hospitals that we serve. Typically when we here on the Sun Coast have a shortage or an extra need, we can call out to New York or Pennsylvania or Texas and get the supply that we need. But right now during this pandemic, the whole country has a blood shortage. It isn't just Sun Coast, it is everywhere. So we can't pick up the phone and call other blood centers across the country for help. The help has to come from within our community. If we had a contest with all the churches on the Sun Coast, Grace would be at the top of the list. I think you're one of the only um, Sunday church drives that we have that we have to send two buses out. What you do is you fill those time slots with donors. Say we're at Grace on a Sunday morning and we have 50 people come out and donate blood. 50 donations will save 150 lives. That's individual lives. But when you think of the blood going to somebody who is sick, you're not only affecting that patient, you're affecting their whole family. So we like to say, you're not saving a life, you're saving a family. You know, I, I had a young lady saying last week that her parents didn't have enough money to share money with nonprofits or charities or that type of thing. But she learned at an early age that her parents could donate blood every 56 days to help other people. So I know in the Christian um, mission and values that we try to give time, talents, and treasure. And think of your blood as a treasure. Our Savior, Jesus, shed his blood for all of us to be saved. And I think that's the same thing that we do as blood donors um, is help to save somebody else's life. It's an opportunity to help others. And isn't that what walking in the Lord's footsteps is all about, is helping others? Wow, isn't that amazing, Grace family? See, we often talk about the many ways that God's using this church to make a difference in people's lives but we really love to take these little snapshots and just give you a real picture to see some of the ways that God's using us. And again, this is just a snapshot. There are so many other things happening around here from outreach events to ministry opportunities to even doing what we're doing right now, which is streaming our services to people all over the world. And the honest truth is that we would not be able to do all that God has called us to do if it weren't for your giving hearts. 
So thank you for being such a generous church and for helping us to reach the unchurched by being intentional neighbors who reflect Christ. And as always, if you haven't taken that step yet and you really do want to be a part of what God's doing here at Grace, we want to give you an opportunity to give as well. See, we believe that giving isn't just something that God wants from us, but giving is something that God wants for us. And so you'll be amazed to see how God can just kind of take whatever we have to give and he can use it not only to reach others, but also to work in your life as well. And there are many ways that you can do that. So just take a look at the bottom of the screen or use the links provided in the chat. If you would, let's all go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to bless this week's offering. Father God, we thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. And and as we give some of it back, Lord, we pray that you would bless it that you would multiply it, that you would bless those who give, and that you would use this giving to bring people to Jesus. We love you, and we thank you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for praying with this Grace family. Now let's continue in worship with the Grace worship team. Would you stand? Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. Let's read this part together. All things have been created through him and for him. Amen.
Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy, holy. Are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Come on, sing that out and believe it. Come on. Holy, are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Come on, what would it look like if we were a church that joined in with the angels and sang that out and believed it? God, we know. Come on, make this a personal time and just worship the Lord for who He is. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. You are holy. You are righteous. You are mighty. You are good and worthy of the praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy is the name of Jesus. Worthy Jesus, you are holy. Come on, sing that out and believe it and proclaim it. Holy. Every voice in this place. Are you Lord God Almighty? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Lord, you are worthy in this place. Your spirit is here, and Lord, we just want to acknowledge you and say that you are worthy. You are worthy in this place. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. We lift you up. We praise you. We honor you. Lord, you are a wonderful God. You are a wonderful Savior. You are good. Father, we just love you. We just take this moment to connect with you, to tell you that we are so humbled and honored to be your children, to know that our sins are cast as far as the east is to the west, to know that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Lord, we are grateful. And Lord, I pray for every person here and every person online that right now for just a moment, they would take a moment and just focus on you and to just worship you for who you are because you are worthy. And Lord, I pray that in the same way that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would minister to us as we go to your word. 
And I pray, Lord, that nobody would leave here the same way as when they came in. and Nobody would tune out on the internet the same way they tuned in. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and you would move in our lives for your glory and for your glory alone. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap and tell him that we love him and you can have a... I was a... Um, you know that worship's good when you just keep crying. Um, worship was great, wasn't it? I mean, our worship team is, uh, is, a, is a good worship team. You know, um, when I study Scripture, and I do the best that I can to be a student of Scripture, one of the things that I try hard to do is to not just read Scripture for what's being said and not just read it for what's going on in its original context to its original people, which I try very hard to do, but one of the things that I try to do more than that is I try to say, okay, God, how does this scripture that I'm looking at, how does it intersect with me right now? How does this, how does this challenge me to live? How does this get me out of my comfort zone? And as we're studying Galatians and we're looking at what I would consider to be text that a lot of people would move through very quickly to get into chapter three and chapter four where it, it seems to be flowing a little bit more about theological things and things that matter to us. But as we're going through Paul's autobiographical account of how he came to have the gospel and how he understood the gospel, it's rich and it's pregnant because we're watching a young man who has been a Pharisee and has been a devoted Jewish person, devoted to Yahweh, devoted to his religion, that has had a massive conversion to Jesus. And we're watching how that plays out, not only in his understanding of his Judaism, but we're also seeing how that plays out in first century Rome, where there was all kinds of political oppression. We're also seeing how it plays out in religion, where he had all kinds of fights with religious people. And we're seeing how he acted, and he wrote, and he lived, and he spoke and he did. And, and when, when we read these things, even though they're autobiographical accounts and sometimes they're easy to move through, there's so much richness because we're, we're seeing in the first century how Christianity and a relationship with Jesus affected a person. And, and then it's allowed, we're allowed to take that and go, how would that look today? What would that look like right now? 2,000 years forward, how would that intersect with my life? And I, and I hope that this weekend as we look at chapter 2 and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 um, as we're going through Galatians line by line, I, I pray that in the midst of seeing how Paul's still recounting an autobiographical account that you'll come to realize none of these words are surplus and none of them are less important. They, they really have tremendous meaning. And so just real quickly, let me summarize what we've done up to this point, and then let's get right into the, the text. Paul, on his first missionary journey, planted multiple churches in this region that we call Galatia, southern Turkey today. And when he left those churches, some men from Jerusalem came down to Galatia, and they said, hey, we, we got to talk to you about what Paul did. You know, Paul came in and told you that if you believed on Jesus, and you guys are Gentiles, that you could be part of the people of God. Well, that's not really exactly the way it works out. Um, we Jews are the people of God, and, and you're Gentiles. And at some point in the future, we'll come together. But right now, the way it works is, is that we're the people of God, and you can proselyte and sort of become part of us. But to do that, you're going to have to be circumcised, and you're going to have to eat right, and you're going to have to obey the laws of Moses. And Paul, when he came, you know, Paul really didn't walk with, the, with Jesus, you know, he wasn't part of the 12, so his gospel, he got it from other people. We know that he made a bunch of trips to Jerusalem, I'm sure people taught him the gospel there, and then what he did is he took it and he made it easier for you all. He told you you could believe in Jesus, and you could be part of the people of God, even though you're Gentiles, and you didn't have to jump through all these hoops. Well, that, that just wasn't the case. Well, when Paul hears that that's going on, and I think those people that came down from Jerusalem, they meant well. They, they, they meant, it, it, Paul's too easy. Just too easy. You can't, it can't be that easy. You're going to have to jump through some hoops if you really want to be a, a follower of Yahweh. You're really going to have to do some things. I mean, this idea of believing in Jesus and then you're in, that, 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 that's, that's too easy. I think they meant well. Paul hears that they've come and said this to this congregation, and he is incensed. 
He is irritated. He's mad. And he writes this letter that we have that we're studying. And and he says to them, if anybody comes and preaches a different gospel than what I preach to you, then they should be accursed. There's really only one gospel. And let me tell you how I got it. These people are telling you that I got it from people and maybe I got it because the church in Antioch set me forward. Let me make it very clear. I got this gospel by a revelation and and God spoke to me and this is the gospel and it's changing lives and I'm going to recount to you, Galatians, how all this came about so that there is no mistake that what I'm speaking to you is in fact the gospel. And so in chapter 2, verse 1, he says this. He says, then after 14 years, now he's told us in chapter 1 that he went to Jerusalem three years after he had had this massive conversion with Jesus. And he went up there for 15 days, he tells us. So like, if you think that I went to Jerusalem to hang out with Peter, to be told the guy, I went for 15 days, and it was three years after I'd had my revelation with with Jesus. So don't think that Jerusalem trip was giving me all this information. However, I want want to be forthright. I had another Jerusalem trip. 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along with me. Now, we we got to, there's a little bit of stuff here we got to work through because this is super important. Paul, when he says 14 years, there is some debate, and it's, 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 it's sort of one of those things where you have to weigh the, the evidence. Is Paul saying 14 years after his conversion, or is he saying 14 years after his first three years? Um, th- there's some debate there. But where the real debate gets involved is, is this trip to Jerusalem, is it historically what happens in Acts 11? Or is it historically what happens in Acts 15? And, and this becomes sort of an internal um, intramural debate. If you, if you talk to people that really read Scripture and really study Scripture, um, it's not massively important to the interpretation of Galatians, but I do think it matters. And so I'm going to tell you what my thoughts are. Um, it, it, it is an opinion. Um, it, it, it doesn't mean that I'm right, although I think I'm right. I wouldn't stand up here and tell you if I knew that I, I'm wrong, but I'm going to tell everybody at church that I'm, that I'm right when I know that I'm wrong. You know, I think this is the right way, and, and I think this is the way that we should see it. I think that the 14 years that he went up to Jerusalem, I think he's referring to what we read in Acts 11. This is a famine visit. I do not believe this is Acts 15, which is the Jerusalem council. There are some that would disagree it's okay, they're wrong, but, um, but, but no, this is just a joke. But, but I do want to, I, 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 I took a risk. I was like, does anybody want to know this or not? And I'm like, no, we're going to teach this and, and, and we're going to help people understand what's going on because these are important. And I think we'll see how this unfolds as a little bit of importance as we continue through the letter because with Peter, we're going to find next week, he's eating with the Gentiles and he pops up and doesn't eat with the Gentiles. That seems to make more sense before a Jerusalem council than after a Jerusalem council. And I'll also show you internally how this sort of makes sense. In Acts 11, Paul is given a prophecy by a person named Agabus that there will be a famine in Jerusalem. And so that revelation is important in that he goes up and and, and we know what happened. Him and Barnabas took money to Jerusalem to help the Jewish people. Um, the church at Antioch was a mixed church between Gentile and Jew, and, and they took it up. I think we'll see as we go through here that this is Acts 11, um, but I want to just bring that to your attention. So 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem. Now, this is where it gets really important that we sort of pay attention. He says, taking along Barnabas and Titus with me. Now, traditionally, if you read that, you'd be like, okay, Barnabas, Titus, no big deal. Now, this is actually really provocative. Because if you, if you remember, the way it was is the Jewish people saw themselves as the people of God. They were the elect people of God, and then there were the Gentiles. And the Gentiles could sort of come in and proselyte, but they never were fully in because in Jewish eschatological views, it was only till the Messiah came and Israel was set up as the nation above all the nations, that's when the nations would be converted. And we studied that in the first, in the first part of this series about Isaiah 2 and those passages. And so for the, for the Jewish people, They saw themselves as a particular group of people. Paul taking Barnabas and Titus to Jerusalem is a little edgy. Why is it edgy? Well, because Barnabas is Jewish, but Titus is a Gentile. Paul is basically saying, I'm bringing two test cases here of what it looks like 
to really preach Jesus. That when you preach Jesus, you bring everybody together. You make one new family. It's, it's all part together. Jesus has exploded into the world. The, the, the new age has started to come into this age. That, that Jesus told us to pray, heaven come to earth. And, and although it's not fully there and one day we're no way it's going to be there, we're to live as if that is a reality, that the old ways have been passed away, that, that, that he's delivered us from this present evil age. And we are now part of a newer age that is dawning and we're to be those people that preach this message. So he takes up Barnabas and Titus with him, which is a really provocative act. Because what he's saying is, is, look, this is what my gospel does. This is how it works. And this becomes super important that we get this. Because if we don't get this message, and the early church struggled to get it, what happens is, is then the Bible and everything that we read starts to become a little bit messed up. And so what Paul is talking about here and what he's doing, and it's, it's huge to Paul that the gospel, that Jesus has died on a cross, risen again, that he can forgive our sins, that we can be part of the family of God. He's going to say that in Galatians 3. He's going to say, you are children of Abraham. And that would have been a bomb in early Judaism to call Gentiles children of Abraham. What Paul is saying here is that there is one family of God. There's not two. There's not Jewish people and then Gentile people. There's not Jewish people and the church. There's, there's not a separation here that everybody's part of the family of God. This is, this is central to the understanding of what Paul is teaching the Galatian church. It's, it's, it's absolutely important. Is that, I guess that was showing on the TV there. All right. Everybody clap for the people that watch uh, on the internet. They, that was... Somebody caught that. That was good. We have a good tech team that catches these things. So, Paul, let me show you how Paul works this out, and he works it out through all of his epistles. But just show you one here in, in Ephesians. He says, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, you, you people that are not Jewish people, Gentiles in the flesh, your, your nationality does not come from a lineage of Judaism. Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. This is pregnant. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Paul, are you saying that Gentiles are now part of... Like, what are you saying here? And strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, now, present, in Christ, you, Gentiles, who were once far off, been brought near by the blood of Christ. Listen to what he says here. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. This is central to Christianity, that there's not some division between one group and another group, because what that distinction does is create all kinds of problems. And, and, it, and it carries in to us today when we exclude certain people and different things with our distinctions as well. Because Paul is saying, listen, somebody who comes to know Jesus is part of the family of God. And don't try to separate out. He says he's made us both one. He's broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. To Paul, this is central to his gospel, is that Jesus has come. And he's made a way for you and me to enter into the family of God. And yes, once we enter in, there's a story that we sort of follow and, and that we do and all of those great things. But to Paul, this is central. And so he goes on. He says, and I went up, took Barnabas and Titus, which is provocative here. I went up because of a revelation. In other words, 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem, I went up because of a revelation. And I said before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. Let's break this down here. He says, I went up because of a revelation. That would, that would be Acts 11, where Agabus had a word from God. He went up because of a revelation that seems to fit Acts 11. And he says, and I set before them, in other words, th th and he uses some irony here, people who seemed influential. He isn't, what he's saying is, is they were definitely influential. These were, these were pillars of the church, but Paul is using that language to say, hey, let me tell you something. When I went up, I wasn't getting stuff from them. I was laying out my gospel to them. I mean, this is 14 years 
after my conversion, or maybe 17 years after my conversion. I mean, I knew what I believed. I knew what I thought. I, was, I didn't need them to tell me what was going on. He says, so I went up because of Revelation, and I set before them, though privately. That wouldn't fit with Acts 15 because that was a council. So think this is Acts 11. Went up because of a revelation, set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential. Why does he say that? Were these people influential? Absolutely. But what he's writing for is to let the Galatians know, I didn't get my gospel from anybody. And yes, I did go to Jerusalem. Let me lay it out how my life went out for you, but I didn't go up there to get something. I went up there out of a revelation, and what I did is I took that opportunity to explain what I had been doing. He said, I set before them privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. And he took Titus and Barnabas as an example of what this gospel is capable of doing. And so when we're stopping here for a minute and we're looking for application, taking Titus it was provocative. It's going to put people in a, in, in a and we're going to see here in a minute, it created a stir. Here's an uncircumcised man that he's saying, he's part of our family. This guy's been changed by Jesus and he's not been circumcised. And by the way, didn't keep the law and doesn't eat the law. They eat the way the law does either. He goes, this guy is just like Barnabas, just like me, Titus is a part. It embodied the gospel. It showed the one family. And then Paul says this. He says, I did this in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. I took Titus, I took Barnabas, and I laid out privately before the people that everybody would have said was influential, but to me they weren't influential because my gospel was not contingent upon them. I laid it out what I preached before them for one reason. I did it in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. What Paul is not saying here is that I set my gospel out in front of them so that they could check off that it was good to make sure that I hadn't been doing something that was wrong. He's not saying that at all. He already knows that what he's doing is right. What he's saying is, is if they disagree that the gospel is for everyone, if they disagree that the gospel brings us all into one family, then this early church experiment is going to be a disaster because I'm out preaching that anybody can come and other people are going to be preaching, yeah, you can come to Jesus, but you also have to get circumcised. You also have to keep the law. And you also have to eat right. So Paul is not saying, I said it in front of them so that they could tell me whether or not I was doing the right thing. What he's saying is, I wanted to know in order because I didn't want to be running in vain. I did not want to have a problem in the early church of where there couldn't be one family. Again, the idea here is the one family of God is in view, which is super important. And then look what he says here. He says, but even Titus, even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised. I mean, let's think about it here. You, 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 the people came into you all, you Galatians, and told you that I gave you half the gospel. You need to get circumcised. Like, I went before the people, like the ones, the pillars. And guess what? Nobody said Titus needed to be circumcised. So why are they saying, but now hold on now, we got, we got some work here to do. We'll get here in a minute. He goes, but, but he wasn't forced. And Paul's going to use this, use forced two other times, and we'll notice it as we go through how he's, what he's doing literarily here. But he wasn't forced to be circumcised. However, as you can believe, it provoked some stuff. Because in the early church, they were still trying to figure this out. They were still trying to figure this out to Acts 15, which is somewhere between 48 AD and 50 AD. Like so many years after Jesus has died, they're still trying to figure out what does it look like to be followers of Jesus. Like this is a big deal. Like this is the early church working this out. And, and, and we've got to figure out how does this intersect in my life? What does this mean for me? What does this mean for our church? What does this mean the way we approach people and talk to people and all these things? This is all important. He says, yet... Because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. He says, hey, what happened was there were some false brothers 
as, as I was there with Barnabas and Titus, and we were discussing the gospel, some people had allowed some other people to slip in, these false brothers who were secretly brought in. This is what's going on up here. This is how it worked when I went to Jerusalem. And what happened was they were trying to spy out like a military incursion. Scouts trying to make sure that the freedom that we had was brought back in Paul's mind to slavery again. They're trying to take us back to Egypt. They're trying to take us back to, we've been free in Jesus. And they're trying, now they didn't think they were doing that. They thought they were making Christians right. They thought they were getting people right. But, but Paul says they were spying out the freedom that we have in Christ. Now, we should stop for a moment here and have a moment. This is an intersection moment. Think about this. What areas in our lives do we allow the freedoms in Christ that we have to get enslaved once again? Legalism? Get ready for this one. Politics? Certain hermeneutical things. Oh, if you don't read the Bible the way I read the Bible, then you're not a Christian. How, ma how many things do we put on people that enslave them again and take away the freedoms that were in Jesus? How many know that there's always people that sneak into churches that want to enslave you again with their junk? We've probably all met them from time to time. They like to come in and they like to tell you, hey, come here, let me tell you. Yeah, what he's saying ain't exactly right. Let me tell you the real story. Let me give you the real skinny. If you really want to be a Christian, this is the way to understand. He says, no, I don't. He goes, I didn't, under no circumstances. Richard B. Hayes says it this way, and he says it great. He's a New Testament scholar, and I love Richard Hayes. He says this, whenever we allow the identity of our community, which would be a church, to be fundamentally defined by any sort of national, cultural, or even religious marker other than the gospel, we are repeating the error of the false brothers. Look what Paul says here. Look at how he responds to this. They'd snuck in. They wanted to spy out our liberty that we have in Christ. He says, to them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He says, I want you to understand, we didn't yield. I mean, we didn't even, it wasn't a second when I realized they were in the room and, and they wanted to get Titus circumcised and they wanted to, to put all that garbage on us and they wanted to tell us that we couldn't be followers of God and people of God by believing only in Jesus, by faith alone, by his grace alone, through Jesus' death alone. He said, anybody that came in there and tried to change that, he said, I didn't yield at all. He goes, I didn't yield in submission even for a moment at all, so that the truth of the gospel would be preserved. And not just for them, but for everybody. Paul's like, I, 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 I didn't go to Jerusalem to get the people to tell me what I needed to do. I went to Jerusalem because there was a famine, and I was taking some support to the Jewish people to help them out. But when I got a moment to talk about my gospel, and some people slid in trying to spy out the liberty that we have in Christ, I didn't yield for a moment, which should make us take a moment here of application and intersection Paul sees the gospel worth going all in for. But this is important. Are there possible areas that we substitute this all in for? Where we go all in for something else. And we're known for something else other than the gospel. Like th this, this epistle is, is so important to a local church because it reminds the local church that if the church isn't preaching the gospel we're not giving the church what they need and we're not giving unbelievers what they need. Like we have to preach the gospel. We have to talk about Jesus. We have to talk about sin. We have to talk about forgiveness. We have to talk about the cross. And we have to talk about resurrection because these are integral to our faith. He says, and from those who seemed to be influential. Again, he's not saying that they weren't. He's just, he's just making sure that the Galatians go, I don't want you to think that somehow I was enamored by these people. Like I came up there to tell them what the gospel was. I was laying out what God had done in me. They weren't, they surely weren't telling me what to do. He goes, and from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those I say who seemed influential, this is so important, added nothing to me. 
Again, he's writing to the Galatians, who some people have snuck in just like this. He's like, they snuck in on me too. But you know what I did? I didn't yield for a moment. And don't you yield either. Because the reality is, is nobody up there added anything to me. The gospel I was preaching was the gospel that needed to be taught. He says, on the contrary, actually. He goes, this is what really happened. He goes, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, when they saw what was going on in my life, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, when, when, they, when they saw that, and this is what's important, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised was working through me with the Gentiles. They couldn't deny it. They, they, they just could not deny it. That this was going on. He says, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, they were pillars, and Paul knows they're pillars, but he's writing to the Galatian church to let them understand, I didn't get my message from these people. I got my message from Jesus. Perceived the grace that was given to me, what did they do? They gave the right hand of fellowship to me and Barnabas that we should go to the Gentiles and then to the circumcised. Why is that important? Because he's writing to a church that has been corrupted, told that he's got half a gospel, and he says, let me recount my life. This happened, I had a revelation. I went to Jerusalem three years, talked to Cephas for 15 days and saw James, that's it. 14 years later, I went up and I didn't go up to get some teaching from them, no matter what these people are telling you. I went up there to lay the gospel out because I went up for a trip where there was famine going on and I wanted to make sure that we took care of the people that were struggling, which then makes the next verse sound really important. And he says, only they asked us to remember the poor. In other words, the offering that you brought up, you and Barnabas, will you continue to do this? Like this is important that we have resources. And, and see, this is what's so awesome. The early church started to see itself as a family, as, as, a, as, as a group of people that were centered around the cross, not their background, not their ethnicity, not their socioeconomic status, that everybody was brought on the same level to the cross. And they said, hey, and by the way, can we also make sure that we remember the poor? Paul said, of course, the very thing that I was eager to do. Interesting that in the middle of the gospel preaching, like getting the gospel right is absolutely imperative. It's interesting that the uh, one other thing, what is the one other thing that you would say after the gospel that we need to get right? Biblically, it's taking care of, of the poor. So let's look at this here and let's, let's take, do some takeaways here. First of all, the gospel story is radical, it's provocative, yet it is massively inclusive. This is so important that we get this. In the early church, what Paul was fighting for is that anybody, no matter where they had come from, no matter what they had done, no matter if what their ethnicity was, is if they came through Jesus. They were part of the family of God without distinction, zero distinction. Paul's gonna tell us in the next chapter this, this radical understanding. He's gonna say this. We're gonna get there in a couple of weeks. He's gonna tell us there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's radical. It's a radical message that don't make a difference where you come from, what you've done, what your past is, no matter what. You can come and you can be part of the people of God, not by anything that you've done, but by faith alone, through grace alone, by Jesus' work alone. Period, end of story. And here's what, here's what the early opponents of Christianity would say about Christianity, this massive in inclusiveness that Christians had, this, this, this fact that the church was like, we don't, we don't care what you've done. We don't care where you've been. We have the answer. And you can come. And you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is understand what Christ has done for you and me. Celsus, a second century philosopher, says this about our common faith. He says their injunctions. What do you mean by that? Their rules, their regulations, their law. Talking about Christians, second century. Their injunctions are like this. He quotes as if he's heard this from Christians. But it's for anyone ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone who is a child, let 
him come boldly. He goes, that's crazy. That's crazy. He says, by the fact that they admit that these people are worthy of their God, they show that they want and are able to convince only the foolish, the dishonorable, and stupid slaves, women, and children. You see, it's crazy. It's crazy that you think a God would take people that are as bad as you take? Give me a break. Can you imagine if every church in America said, man, bring in everybody that's done everything wrong. We've got an answer. You are welcome here. We want you here. We want to serve you coffee here. We want you to have the best seat here. We'll ride you in our golf cart because we want to introduce you to the one who will meet you right where you are and will change your life forever. I mean, that, that's the message. So whosoever will. It's not you got to get it right and it's perfect. And we do it. We do it in the church. We don't do the distinction anymore between Jew and Gentile. We do it eschatologically, but we, but we don't do it in the way we do it. But we do it with other, oh, you, you did this or you did that or you think that or you, did, or you don't read the Bible this way or whatever. Let me tell you something. What brings you and me into the family of God is not getting everything right. It's getting one person right. And his name is Jesus. That's, that's the gospel. It's that we need Jesus. We're sinners in need of salvation. And there's nothing we can do. It is by faith alone, through the grace of God alone, based on what Jesus has done for you and me alone. And that is a glorious message. It's radical. It's provocative. It's massively inclusive. And secondly, the gospel story doesn't allow you and me to forget the poor. And when I look back at church history, one of the things I realize is the church was known for being a place that said, hey, come on. And, and I want to I take a moment here. And, and I want to I brag a little bit on you all. But let me tell you something. In Haiti... We fed a thousand poor people because of your generosity. There's money going right now to Louisiana to feed the poor in Louisiana. We found a place that we knew we could trust and we'll get people. This church helps the local food bank downtown that serves the poor. It's another church that does it. We're, we're like, you guys do it better than we would do it. We're going to help you. We, we've bought food when they needed food. We, we've run stuff when they needed stuff. We've staffed when they needed staff. I mean... But this church, and maybe we don't do the greatest job about it, but let me tell you something. This church has a heart to take care of the poor. And I'm going to tell you this. There's people that know this, and, and they'll say amen. There's people that go to this church that have fallen on hard times. And let me tell you something. It's one of the greatest days in the world when we as a staff get to go and help them and see them be blessed because the local church took care of people that were in need. Paul says... I only ask. It's what we ask. Remember the poor. Paul says, I was eager, eager to do that. Can you imagine? I mean, in this, I'm, I mean I'm trying. I'm doing, I mean, I, I can't change the world, but I can use my voice right here. And I have a lot of people that want to tell me how to use my voice on all kinds of things. But I'm going to tell you how I'm going to use my voice. I'm going to tell you as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that it is time that we do not settle for anything coming out of our mouth other than the gospel to other people that are lost, telling them about Jesus, and we make sure that we are doing good works in this community to take care of the poor and the marginalized and those that are in need. Because when the church speaks Jesus and the church gets involved in the people that are suffering, let me tell you something, it gets the attention of people that don't go to church. And they start to perk up and look. And you see it is in Acts 2, right? Where it says they were selling their stuff and giving it to those who had need. And what happened? It says they had favor with the people. And God was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. Had favor with the people. I say this all the time. We've got it backwards. We think that we're supposed to run out there and irritate everybody. That's not what we're called to do. 
If the gospel offends, that is okay. But it shouldn't be you and me that are going out of our way to offend. We should be doing good works and loving people in such a way that people start to take notice. They go, man, I want to be a part of that. Did you know that the younger generation, 30 and younger, you know what they're looking for more than anything? They're looking to be invested in something that's larger than them that they feel like is making a difference in the world. Bingo, we have the gospel. Now, here's what I want to say in closing. I know many people are here and you feel like, man, I hear that, but you don't understand where I'm at. You don't, you don't understand what's going on in my life. Like, I mean, I, 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 I want to do more, but I just don't feel like I can take that next step. I just, I mean, I just, where I'm at. Let me end with a story here and maybe this will inspire you a little bit. There was a painter that painted this painting and on the painting, it, it, it was sort of like a side view of a little boy. You could see just, it was a little boy and then there was a chess table and on the other side of the chess board was this dark hooded figure. And it said checkmate. And people would come and look at the picture and they were blown away because the hooded figure in just a few moves had checkmated this young man. The person who painted it was ecstatic. I mean, he had an ego. People would say, this is a great painting, man. I can't believe that you know chess so well that you put this thing together and just these few moves, this boy's checkmated. And people would come from all around and look at this picture and tell him, what a great job. One day he had an older man that came in, looked at the picture, backed up, looked at the picture again. And the, the guy who had painted the picture was just waiting any minute for him to say, man, this is an incredible picture. But the old man turned around and he goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a champion at chess. He says, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the boy has another move. The guy said, what? He said, no, he's got another move. Let me show you. He can move from here to here. He goes, in fact, if he moves from here to here, a couple other moves, he can actually checkmate this person. And the guy said, what? They can't, it can't be. He goes, no, no, the boy's got another move. Can, can I tell you something? Hear my heart. Hear my heart. No matter where you're at in life, you always have another move with Jesus. You always have another move. And that movement is significant because when we move towards the cross, which is, it levels everything. It levels where you've come from. It levels your ethnicity. It levels your socioeconomic status. It levels how much of the Bible you know. When we come to the cross, what we find is that when we give up what we're looking for and we get our identity from the cross, which seems to us like we're losing everything. I'm having to give up everything for this. Yeah, when we give up everything at the cross, what happens is, is we get back more than we could have ever gotten if we would have had all of the things that this world affords. And I just want to encourage you to, to take a step this weekend. I don't know what that step is. I mean, for me personally, I would hope the step would be that you want to get involved in some ministries around here and you want to get out there and start preaching the gospel and telling people about Jesus. But that step may not be your step right now. It may be. It may be the step you need to make. But the step you need to make may need to go home and talk to your wife. It may, it may mean that you need to go home and have a conversation with somebody else that you're in a bad relationship with. It, it may mean that you need to sit down and have a moment with God and just say, God, I, I'm lost. God, I, don't, I just don't know. I don't know where I'm at with you anymore. This last couple of years has been just a trying time. And, and I'm, just, I'm just existing. And God, I, I need to, the step I need to take is towards you, but I don't even know how to make that step. But you're not here and you're not tuned in just because. You're here because God wants you to know there is another step. And that step is to take a step towards the old, rugged cross. 
And when we take that step, it changes everything. Even for those of us that are believers, another step towards the cross is the greatest step that we can take. The worship team's gonna come out now and we're gonna sing a song. And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. If you wanna stand, I'd, I'd love for you to stand. If you wanna sit, you can remain seated. If you wanna come and pray, you can come and pray. I just want you, I want our church, I want those online to take a step this weekend towards Jesus. And we're gonna sing a song we're going to follow it up with another song. And all I'm going to ask you to do is to just take a moment with the Lord to reflect on the gospel, what that means for you and me, and to believe that Jesus has conquered death, hell, and the grave, and that he can do more for you and me than any other thing this world can afford. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for your glory and for your glory alone, that this would be a holy moment right now. This would be a moment where people take a step, whatever that step may be. And it would be a moment, Lord, that you do the miraculous in their life for your glory. If you want to stand with us now, you can. If you want to remain seated, you can. But will you sing with us and let's make this a holy moment.
that day. On that day, He comes in glory to reveal the fullness of His reign. I hope that today's service spoke to you in a meaningful way, and I pray that you were able to have more than just a good experience this weekend, but that you were able to have a real encounter with Jesus. And that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And so if there's anything more that we can do to help you find God's direction for your life, like if you would love prayer or just to talk to someone directly or just to share how God's really used this ministry in your life, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can either email grace at gracesarasota.com or you can call the number that's on the screen and in the chat. Again, we would love to hear from you. And if there's anything that you need, we are there for you. And once again, to anyone who is here as a new guest this weekend, we really would love to meet and connect with you. Remember to stop by gracesarasota.com and click the I'm new button, or you can use your phone to text new guest SRQ to the number 97000. Both ways will allow you to fill out our digital connect card and receive a free gift from our church. Plus, you'll be able to plan a future visit to our Lakewood Ranch campus or our Bee Ridge campus right here in Sarasota. But everyone, it is now time for all of us to go out and be those intentional neighbors who reflect Christ. We love you. We cannot wait to see you again next time. And don't forget to bring a friend. Mm -hmm. Thanks again for joining us here at Grace, where everyone is welcome. Bye, y'all.